Hello. So I'm talking about chatbots today. The picture is hopefully someday you'll have your chatbot walk the path of life with you. So we'll first talk about what a conversation is, the uh, current understanding of it, what we're trying to aim for with our chatbots. And then we'll talk about three different levels of chatbots. We'll talk about the purposeless mimicry agents, um, and then we'll talk about attention-based agents. So purposeless mimicry would be like Eliza, these kinds of things that just take a bunch of data and then spit out what someone might say. Attention-based agents might be like Alexa, the home assistant, or Siri. And then conversational agents, which have to actually keep track of state and how a conversation is unfolding over time. So we'll discuss a little bit about some plumbing, so how to text-to-speech, speech-to-text. I'll show you some additional resources that you can learn more, and then we'll conclude. Okay. So, conversation. So, conversation requires shared reference. So, you'd have to be knowing that you're talking about the same thing. So, one guy sees an elephant. Uh, someone else says, someone else looks at the person looking at the elephant and notices that the person is pointing pointing at the elephant or the mastodon or whatever this may be. And then that person is able to see the same thing out of all the clutter in the environment. And now they know in their heads they have this shared idea. There's the mastodon. So if they're going to make any kind of statement or indication about it, they know what they're talking about. And so you could say that language begins with this shared attention by pointing to things out in the world. And then from there, it evolves to using words to point to shared concepts within our brains. And so, how could these shared concepts start to come to have labels, have words associated with them? So there's Wittgenstein, which you, you all hear about when you hear about natural language processing. He had this thing called language games, which is like a, a, a miniature version of something where you can get a better understanding of how some people's language works. And so they had this thing building building a, a building or building some kind of construction. They said, bring me the beam. And you can imagine this, this other person bringing over different things until the one person says, ah, yeah, that's what I want. And then from there, they get a sense of what the word should be associated with each object. And so you have this kind of um, community understanding of what utterances go with different things. And so now we have reference in the world, and now we have words that correspond to different things. And eventually, because we are beings that interact and see the world, we're going to have our own internal conceptual structure of what these things are. So we're going to get sensation coming in, we're going to have this deep representation of the world, and we're going to have action. And when someone says being, that no longer is just that particular thing, it's everything it represents, everything we can do with it. And so if someone says being, now we go, okay, I know what you're talking about. That's the being, that's the thing that I can pick up and carry and hurt my back. And, uh, and so we, we understand each other not just by interacting with each other, but also by using the labels that tie into our shared experience. And in addition to this, we, we continue to negotiate language as we go. So there's this pyramid idea with these levels of discourse. You start out the instruction, you know, bring me the beam, and then if there's any kind of confusion, you can talk about what words mean or what words correspond to different things. And then if that doesn't work, then you say, okay, by beam, my mean this particular thing. And so if you have, if you have trouble, you kind of move up the pyramid. Um, and then as someone starts to understand, then you move back down and you can go back to the level of instruction. And so we can kind of see that where this is going to come to chat box because you can't sit there and, with Siri and talk about what you mean by what you mean. I mean by what you mean by what you say. She either understands you or she doesn't. Um, so here's an example. Um, you can say, get me some fish. And the person's like, what? Well, how, how would I go about doing that? And he's like, okay, you catch a fish with a fishing pole. And the person's like really dense, like, well, well, what's a fishing pole? And he's like, okay, a fishing pole is a stick, a string, and a hook. So like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I have to put that. And then you come back down, and then the person ends up going to get you some fish. So this is how we can have conversations that build language and build understanding as we go. In addition, conversations have their own rules. 
So in addition to just what things mean, we even talk beyond what things mean and say things that aren't even true in order to get um, information across. So you may have heard about these uh, Grace's axioms. I'm sorry, Grace's maxims. So one is the maximum of quantity. So you only say what's not implied. So you might say, bring me to block, but you wouldn't say, bring me to block by transporting it to my location. The second part is redundant. If you say that, you must be meaning something other than bring me to block. There must be some additional meaning that the, the listener has to figure out. Uh, the maximum quality is you only say things that are true. So if you say, I hate carrying blocks, I know what you mean because I hate carrying them too. But if you say, no, I love carrying blocks, and I especially like when they're covered in fire ants, well, I know that you must not mean that because you'd be breaking the maximum of quality. And so you must be being sarcastic. So you convey meaning beyond the words by breaking the conversational, uh, conversational rule. In addition, there's the relevance. You only say things that matter. And, and this all seems trivial to us, but you can imagine with a computer, you have all these things you can say, and you can, you know, you can imagine a huge page of first order logic, and which part of it so that convey to the person. And it's these things. You only say things that, you know, quality, quantity, and the things that matter. So, you know, bring me the block is fine, but bring me the block and bird sing is not fine because even though bird sing is true, what does it have to do with the block and the person's going to be confused even though you said something that's completely true? Uh, and then the maximum manner, you need to say things in a way that can be understood. So if someone says, you know, you personal physical force to levitate the block and transport it to my location, they're going to think you're talking about something else than you're talking about. Why would someone ever say that? And so in addition to the, what the words mean and we've established how to uh, convey concepts, you have to follow the rules of, of conversation. And it's not just the words and the rules of conversation, it's also how you say them. So you say, you know, I don't. So that means, okay, so don't ask me, right? If you say, you know, I don't, it's like, as a matter of fact, I really don't. Okay. You have to get it said it just right. You know I don't. As a matter of fact, I really don't. Or you know I don't. You know that I don't. See, the way these three things all mean three different things, even though it's the exact same words. And, uh, Computers have a really hard time with this. This is called property. So these are kinds of things that we're shooting toward with our chatbot. If your chatbot's going to walk with you through your life, it's going to have to do all of these things. So we've talked about what conversation is, and now we're going to talk about the, uh, the current state of chatbots. So I'm going to lead you through the purposeless mimicry, then the intention-based, and then the conversational. So let's start with purposeless mimicry. So we've all heard of Elisa, Eliza. So it's a simple substitution. So you have this, uh, you know, my mother wants me to buy a bazooka, and you imagine some guy laying on a couch in the 60s, and the, and the psychologist, instead of being alarmed by this, would say, well, tell me why your mother wants to buy you a bazooka. And, and the conversation would go on and on without the psychologist ever really saying anything. And this is the Rogerian uh, school of psychology that came after behaviorism. And so they built a chatbot to mimic this. We've probably all heard about it. What you can do is you can go to this location, and uh, it popped up, but I didn't say it. I'm going to put these slides uh, online on my LinkedIn, and also I'll tweet it out um, at Jay Mugan. I'll probably do that while I'm sitting there during someone else's talk. And uh, so you don't have to like kind of like down these links or anything. So you have a Python implementation of, of Eliza if you want to try it out, and you can add your own you can add your own uh, your own pattern. So you know I type this one in. I want to buy a well, sorry, I want to buy, and then you use that little symbol. And so anytime anybody says I want to buy, my chatbot's going to respond in one of these three things. You know, if it's, I want to buy a taco. How much does a taco cost? Or it may say, you ain't going to buy a taco, not on my watch. Or it may say, well, a taco finally filled that hole in your soul. And it would just be completely random. <laughs> no matter what they say, there's no understanding here. Um, and so, you know, I want to buy a car. How much does a car cost? And there's really no point in these kinds of 
chat box. So when, when Elisa first came out, or Eliza first came out, there was, they were amazed at how long people would talk to these things and they would give their personal secrets. And, uh, and it's because, of course, deep inside, anything that talks we feel is human. It triggers these, 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 uh, these parts in our brain that we have no control over. And so we naturally kind of think it's human, and so we naturally kind of talk to it. Um, but there's really nothing going on, and it's, these kinds of things are pretty pointless. And when you hear people talking about passing the Turing test of being indistinguishable from a human, computer scientists always tend to scoff at the Turing test, and this is why. Um, you could make a really good robot that does this um, without there being any intelligence at all. Now, to really pass the Turing test, you'd have to, to get even deeper than this, but at the same time, it's not one-to-one -one with actual intelligence, and that's why computer scientists kind of scoff at it. Uh, they don't scoff at Turing himself, but they scoff at taking it literally. Um, Turing, of course, is, uh, is our patron state. So, okay, so modern mimicry agents um, work differently. They're data-driven, because we're all data-driven these days. So you'll have, um, you have movie and TV subtitles. You can download all these subtitles of movies and TVs, and so... You know, given one line of dialogue, you can train your computer, and we'll see how in just a moment. Given one line of dialogue, you can train your computer to just come up with whatever the next line would be, even if that line is not in this database, just by using machine learning. You can mine Twitter to look for replies, and if I may replies, you can make a bunch of lists that way. There's also the Ubuntu dialogue corpus, which is people, you know, technical support. These are used for a lot of papers. And so we'll look at one way if you wanted to make a a database mimicry agent will look at doing that now using deep learning. So deep learning is um, all the rage, and for good reason. It, um, it's really changed things. So sequence-to-sequence model. Um, so sequence-to-sequence model is you take some text, like, uh, you know, you take a di one line of dialogue, and you encode it down to a vector, and then you decode that vector into some other sequence of text. And if you have a whole bunch of training data, you can learn to do this. You can learn to take your, your vector and, and, and write it out. And this initially came from um, machine translation. You would have you know, a million sentences in English all translated into Spanish. And so over time, you could just take it through the algorithm I'm going to show you in just a moment. It will eventually learn to write the Spanish for the English, and this is now how machine translation is mostly done. And this is done using recurrent neural networks. So let's let's take a look at that. So um, how are you? So you take this um, you take this word how, and you make it the initial state. Um, and this how is going to have a vector associated with it. And there's a talk later today about how to get these vectors. These vectors come naturally also through this sequence to sequence model. Initially, it could be um, initialized randomly to a 300 dimensional random vector. And through training, it'll actually learn what it should be. So you take your how, and this is the state of the sentence, eight zero, the vector of how. And then you have all, which is the next statement, the next, next word. And what you have is you have a current neural network, which in its simplest form is two matrices right here at this junction. And if one matrix multiplies times the vector that is the state, and the other matrix multiplies times the vector that is this next word, add them together and you get your state, your new state. And it's a current neural network, so as you go, it's always going to be these same two matrices. Now, in reality, you have these things called uh, LSTMs, which have some internal memory. Um, but what you're doing is you're taking um, two vectors coming in, putting it through some uh, deep learning machinery, which is basically just a bunch of uh, matrix multiplications with nonlinearities on top. And the nonlinearities, I said, doesn't all switch down into a... a, a uh, just one multiplication of that makes it deep, and, and you keep going that way. So then you have right here, you have the next word come in, and this looks like it's a new level in the, in the deep neural network, which it is, but it's the same um, parameter values, the same two matrices in this most simplest case, and you just keep going, and every time you get a new word, you generate a new state, which is a state vector is about 300 dimensional um, real value. And you keep going all the way to the end, and now you're done. Your sentence is done, 
and you have H3, which is a, a vector representation of the sentence, how are you? Okay? This is a current neural network. And so now that's the encoding part. So for the decoding part, you start off with um, you start off with your state from before in the simplest case. And you generate, you have a, a, a part of your recurrent neural network generates a word. Um, in reality, this is a, a softmax uh, multi-dimensional classification problem. Um, generally, you have a vocabulary size of like 50,000 different words that it could generate. So you generate the first word. And then you have this next state. So given you have another recurrent ne neural network, this is the decoder recurrent neural network. And you take the previous state and the previous word, you generate some next state. And then you do your 50,000 dimensional classification problem again. How am, oh, I am, right? And then you just keep going. Generating new state, 50,000 dimensional. And you keep going until you hit some special stop symbol, which in this case is just a punctuation. And so I am great. And so you have now this, this thing stops and the way it learns is if you would have written, you know, if the, if the network would have decided here, I am car, that's something not someone people generally wouldn't say, and it's not going to be in the training data. And so it's going to get punished. And then not only is it going to get punished here, it's going to get punished here because then maybe the previous state was wrong. And it goes all the way back, all the way back to the encoder all the way back to those uh, vectors down that, that correspond to the word, and this is through back propagation. It's not reinforcement learning, so I would punish, but it's back propagation, which is just the chain rule in calculus, um, all the way back. And then that's why you need so much training data, because you've got to train all this thing all the way back. But if you have a lot of training data, it's really amazing stuff, and then you can just have it generate, you know, if you turn it on Twitter, it'll sound just like Twitter. It'll sound just like somebody talking. Um, but of course, there's no understanding here. Um, it just treats this, you know, there's a machine and they're just generating tokens that match its training data. Um, and this will work on just about any kind of problem where you have sequences to sequences. Sorry, I just cut off at the bottom. Um, but there's no understanding. But it still works really well if, if you have a lot of data. And so there is a industrial strength sequence to sequence implementation in um, TensorFlow. TensorFlow is the Google uh, deep learning framework, and you can you can look at it there. And then there's the code, and there's a lot of great documentation on how to run it. Um, so any questions so far? Yeah, yeah, you'd use a special symbol probably. Um, that's right. And if you want your thing to output more than one sentence at a time, you put the stop symbol at the end of the sentence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so the, the RNN is a different model than words of that, but the vectors learned for the words are very similar. They have some of the same properties of, you know, as we'll see later, there's the king minus queen, there's man minus woman, but it's sort of that kind of stuff. It's, um, it's more complicated than a word to vec model, um, but you end up with vectors for words that are basically the same. And yet, yeah, the, the representation is that you have a, a 300 dimensional vector. So, in this is the sequence to sequence stuff, and this was big um, about two years ago. It's still huge. This came on the scene a couple years ago. Now, who knows the new thing on the scene everybody's excited about? GAN, Generative Adversarial Networks. And so these are all the rage in um, computer vision where they're doing amazing things. You can turn horses into zebras and you can 
you pick out somebody's part of somebody's face and this thing will put in what it should be and it's just really great stuff. And so you have this discriminator. So what we saw here with um, our sequence sequence models, our decoder was actually generating a sentence. And the way we determined that whether or not it was a good sentence or not was we just had our training data and we said, okay, does this match the training data? So a generative adversarial network does something a little different. You generate a sentence and then you have this whole other neural network that says, well, is this a good sentence? And the way it decides that is, can I tell the difference between this sentence that was generated by your network and a real sentence? And so you have this kind of arms race between your generator and the discriminator learning to get better and better, and then they, uh, they bring out the best in each other. It works really well for image processing, less so so far for language, because the image processing, you have a nicer gradient on the pixels, whereas words are very discrete things, and if you change it a little bit, it might change it some word you don't want. Um, but we're, uh, we're making progress on language as well. And so here's a, here's, a, here's a link, and then there's a code in port, not Python, unfortunately, um, for neural dialogue generation. There is a lot of Python, um, GAN, um, code, but this one in particular was for in ports, which ports is, I think, a Facebook um, thing, and they have a PyTorch now, which is a Python implementation or a Python linkage to ports. I haven't used it, but people say great things about it. Okay, so that is purposeless mimicry agents. Now we're going to go one step better in understanding and talk about intention based agents. And so intention-based agents are probably the ones we, we talk with the most. Um, you know, Amazon Echo, Google Assistant, Siri, Cortana. Um, so there's, there's two steps in what these things do. They identify what the user wants. You know, you say, Alexa, order me some groceries. And the second one is to figure out the details of the intent so the machine can take action. So, of course, ordering some groceries, there's no details that can be useful there. I mean, do you have any groceries in particular? But you say, Alexa, you know, play the doors. And then, it, okay, so then the intent would be play music, and then the thing you have to figure out is what music in particular does this person want to hear. And so this is the intention-based agents. They don't have conversations that go multiple times, but you're starting to get more understanding here because it has a no what you want because it has to do something in particular in the physical world. And so the two, two things here is determine the intent and figure out what to do with it, and we'll go through both. So the first thing, figure out the intent. Uh, there's two basic ways to do this. You can use keywords or you can use text-based classification. So text-based classification is just machine learning with a multi-output. Um, so you say, get me 14 chickens, and then you run it through your classifier, of course, you have to have a lot of label data for text classification. Keywords, you don't need label data. You've just got to come up with good keywords. Um, so keywords are text-based classification, and, and, and the agent may say, okay, this, this is if you want to adjust the lights, order groceries, make an appointment, raise an army. You have to come up with these things with a lot of training data or your keywords. So that's the first step. And you can do this in Python pretty easily if you have if label data. There's a couple ways. You can have your bag of words representation in Scikit Learn. So, bag of words is just is um, just a listing of what words are in the sentence. It doesn't care about the order. So, a bag of words would treat man bites dog and dog bites man as the same sentence. But in each word is a feature that goes into a classifier. So, the advantage there is it's very simple, um, and you can you can run it in Python. You can also use deep learning to do these things, and deep learning uses the order of the words, but you need more training data. And you can use a convolutional neural network, and convolutional neural networks are really big in computer vision, and they're, they're starting now to have a bigger impact in natural language processing. And here's a link to a really great implementation. Um, everything's ready to go. They have a task where you can train on. The task is sentiment analysis. You have a bunch of movie reviews, positive sentiment, negative sentiment, and it figures it out. You can, of course, use this to figure out intention. Yes? I think the, um, generally you want hundreds of thousands, but it, it depends on how complicated the task is. So this, 
example passed for whether or not the movie is a positive view or a negative view is only a few thousand, I think. Um, so, if it, yeah, the more complicated, the more subtle the task, the more data you need. Um, yeah, for machine translation, there's millions of examples. Um, and this one's only a few thousand. And I've been amazed at how well this text classification CNN works. Um, it's really good stuff. Now, the second part, once you know what the person wants, you have to turn it into what exactly they want you to do as the agent, right? So you have, um, get me 14 chickens, it goes into natural language understanding, and out comes a Python dictionary. In the Python dictionary, presumably there's some computer program that's set up to handle this thing, and this is machine readable, so notice I wrote chicken ID 344, it's made some particular choice that it can go look up in a database. So what we'll do next is we'll look at how this natural language understanding can actually be done. We'll do that in a decent amount of detail. So let's start here. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a context-free grammar. So context-free grammar has some left-hand side. So we have order. In order, now we know the person's making an order, so we define this grammar. An order is a purchase, a statement of purchase, and, how, and what and how much. So then we have this thing called D union, which I've just defined as dictionary union. So you take the um, composition of the two parts of the rule, purchase and item amount, and you just union them. The S is the uh, semantics coming up from the bottom. So what we have here is a context-free grammar with semantic attachments. So every time a rule in this context-free grammar is triggered, we say the semantics, what that thing actually means, we have to put it right on the side here. And so this is very similar to our language game, where, of course, our machine is not learning the semantics. We just say, okay, as humans, we've learned what a block is, and we're going to put that at the end. And so what we have here is the next rule. So we say, okay, this rule here, it's a purchase and item amount, and we're using this compositional thing to, to decode that. And so now we have the next rule. Well, what is actually a purchase? So I've defined a little function called is purchase tokens, because we have our grammar that looks at, at groups of tokens, our parser. And so I say is purchase is the I manually define get me, buy, grab me some, right? So if you have tokens that fit any of these patterns, then is purchase is, is triggered, and then I say, okay, this person is purchasing something. They're not returning something. They're not, um, they're not just asking for the price. The main purchase, and that's the meaning of if you use these things. And this will get um, union with this item amount, so let's look at item amount. So we have item amount is amount and item. And so, you know, 14 chickens. 14 is the amount, item is chickens. And we take the, uh, the semantic meaning is to squish together the item and amount, 14 chickens. And so now, what is amount? So amount is... Anytime you say a number. So you have is number, a little function here. Well, I didn't write it down because I thought it was obvious. So if someone says 14, 612, a whole bunch, all those things could be a month. And you'd have to have a function that's able to identify those things. And then the meaning of that is amount, which is a keyword known by your algorithm as it does something in the world. And then you... Um, you convert it to a number. So if someone writes 246, you can convert that to an image. And so now you have an actual meaning that a computer can understand. So this looks trivial, and it is, of course, but we've gone from our squishy world into something a computer can understand with this world. And finally, we have item. So is item. So is this something that is um, in our database? that if it's Amazon Alexa or whatever to buy, and then you have this function get item, that if someone says chickens, it just maps it to ID 344, 
So this could be some, uh, this could be a complicated function. It may return nothing if it's not an item it has, um, but that's what we have here. And so you parse the text with this, and this union, this D union, this propagates up, and you end up with this dictionary that then can be fed to a computer, and the computer can actually do what you want. And so this is actually how these these, these things work. Um, so let's look at a little bit of detail in parsing. Hopefully not too much that it, that it kills you, but uh, parsing is done using that bottom-up dynamic programming. And so for each box, we're going to look at all the possible things in between. So what we're going to have here is we have get me 14 chickens. And we're going to say, okay, we're going to go, okay, first we're going to say, we're going to start here and move across. And as we move across, we're going to look at bigger and bigger swaths. And it is dynamic programming because if we do some parse rule here, it may be used multiple times down the line, but we don't have to redo the computation dynamic programming. You, you break up a problem in the sub-problems and you save those sub-problems and then you can reuse them over and over again. And that's the beauty of dynamic programming. So we do get this map. You know, if we do get, we're just going to look at the set of tokens, get to get. And then as we move across, we're going to look at more and more tokens. So notice how here, at this box here, we're looking at everything from mean to chickens. We're saying all the things that have been parsed between here. And then here, at the very bottom, this is where our answer is going to be. You have the whole sentence. And up here, you just have the word. 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 And so it's an n cubed problem because we see the n squared, where n is the length of the sentence. You have to go all the way across. And for each item, you have to go all the way back, conceivably. And then for each one inside, you have to look at all the different in between things. So let's take a look at that, how that could work. So you have, um, here's our table. Here's how it works. So you do get, just goes to get. Um, then you have, the next thing is me, just goes to me. But now we're here, which means we look at get me, and so we can look here. Get me, oh, well, that goes to purchase. And now we move over here, we start at a map. 14, well, 14 all by itself is an amount, so we just keep going down, and we can't map that with purchase at all. And then we have chickens. So chicken up, uh, in itself, number seven, is just a chicken. And then, but, you can map it with item amount once you can start to go back, because this maps the item, and this maps the amount, and so this box here is the item amount. And then order, which says item amount, and uh, purchase, see this, and then it uses order, and then this one here we've already got, we don't have to go all the way back to get because purchase already took get into account. And now here at the very end is the order rule. And so in addition to doing that, you also store the semantics that you've encoded along the way. And um, here you are, domain purchase, item, chicken ID uh, 344, and amount, and so this is compositional semantics at its core how it works. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so context-free grammar is um, sort of a regular language, which is anything that can be done with a deterministic finite automaton. And then you have a context-free grammar, which is the next thing in the Chomsky hierarchy, which means you have, essentially, you have one thing here, and then you have two non-terminals here. You can have multiple non-terminals, but what makes it uh, context-free is this thing over here can't have anything else around it. This thing has a trigger regardless of what's around it, and that's the context-free. And then here I said there's two, and we noticed in the parsing algorithm that there has to be two things because we're always looking. Um, you're looking, you know, if you're here, you're looking um, back at two things, and you're also looking all the way through, but you're looking at, you're breaking up for the dynamic programming part, and you're breaking it in twos. You know, is, if I break the sentence at this point, here and here, is there a parse that comes together to fit this thing? Or if I break it here and here, is there a parse? We always break it into twos, but the good thing is the context-free grammar can always be converted to some other grammar 
that has that two uh, thing on the on the right hand side. So on the left hand side you have one non terminal symbol, and the right hand side you have two non terminal symbols. And then you can have rules that just go uh, non terminal to terminal. The terminal is um, your actual, uh, you know, like an actual uh, thing that doesn't have things below. But yeah, but that's what context free means. Now. So context sensitive grammars aren't really used very often. Um, one problem with context-free grammars is you, you, could, you get this huge number of rules. So if you try to represent English with a context-free grammar, all of English language, it doesn't work because you have, um, you know, you have to keep track of gender and you have to keep track of tense and all these things, and it becomes really hard. So they use something called um, unification grammars. But this is just a... Uh, this works really well if you have a pretty limited domain. If you already know the intention, then you're basically just trying to figure out how to get the person exactly what they want, then you can use this context-free grammar. And you can play with this. There is code um, called Sippy Cup, which was a uh, code base created for a Stanford National Language Understanding course. Um, and so it, it's really beautiful because it's, it's, it's from first principles. It's just Python code, and that's all it is. It, it does exactly what I just showed you, the, the, the parsing. Yes? Uh -huh. Yeah, so you put them all in there. So at the end here, you could have a whole bunch of parses that, 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 that work. And you have to decide... All of these meanings, you know, there could be dozens of them. All of these meanings are valid parses of what the person said. And now the question is, given all these valid parses, how would I decide um, between them? And so what you can do is you can have a you can have a scoring mechanism at the end that scores certain parses over others. One way to do a scoring mechanism um, is to have certain rules have certain um, uh, importance over others. So this rule, if it's triggered, oh, okay, this is what we want. Um, another thing that I've done in the past is the more detailed, the better. Um, so I, one scoring method that I use is I say, okay, do you have a lot of things here? If that has a lot of things, then you're more likely to have a, a better part. And then you can even take it one step further, and if you have a whole bunch of training data, you can have it learn, given a set of features, you can have to learn future values, and you can learn how to decide which price is best. Yes. No, that's a good question. So the question is, well, instead of doing the symbolic, once you know what the person wants, once you break it off into a sub-problem, and in that sub-problem, do like a sequence of sequence deep learning kind of thing. One problem with that is these sequence of sequence models don't care a whole lot about details. So if you say, you know, give me 14 chickens, it may respond with an order of 23 chickens. And in the sequence to sequence model, there's only one term that's different. It's hard for us to really get the cost right. And so it says, well, this is pretty close, but 23 seconds is a big difference from 14. And so you end up having a hard time making sure it does exactly what you want with these little details, especially with numbers and dates and that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, this is semantic parsing. Oh, yeah, so, so this is a form of semantic parsing. There's a whole bunch of different methods. Um, word sense disambiguation um, is a little different problem, but it has to kind of solve that as part of its problem. Um, it's not too related to word sense disambiguation. Word sense disambiguation, word sense disambiguation, I can't say it, but you know what it is. If the word bank, um, do I mean a bank where you buy something or do I mean a riverbank, right? And that's 
given the sentence, I need to figure out which meaning that is. And that's often done using machine learning, looking at the words around it. You could do that here as a preprocessor step. Um, that would probably be the best thing to do. Kind of preprocessor. Okay, so I think we've got like 10 minutes left. We got five minutes left. Um, oh, yeah, sure, sure. So let's talk with conversational agents, the final part. So we should be good. Um, okay, so I wrote a blog post not too long ago because I had this dream of my little conversational agent going with me through life. And in order to do that, what makes conversational agents different from what we've seen is that you have to have a conversation that goes on over time. It has to remember what you said 10 minutes ago or even yesterday. And so, you know, in my, in my, uh, in my dream, it'd be a teacher for the young. You could have like a little cell phone app and you could talk to it and it would teach you math. And then, but it would get to know you along the way. So when you became an adult, it would then just turn in your operating system because you're already used to interacting with it all the time and it knows everything you want. And then, as an adult, it can give you turn-by-turn -turn directions on how to push the washing machine. And for me, it would know that it has to be very specific, because all I know is lefty loosey, righty tighty. And so it would give directions at that level. And then, as an adult, as if, if my brain and cognitive agents start to go, it could let me live by myself longer, because it would know if I'm standing in the kitchen and want, I want to make coffee, and I forgot how to make coffee. So you need a conversational agent. This is a whole different level than what we've seen previously, because it needs to keep track of a whole different set of things. So, you need what's something, what's called a dialogue manager. So, a dialogue manager takes the person through these different things. And dialogue manager says, okay, I'm going to teach her math, and then I'm going to teach her this, and I'm going to teach her that. And then, oh, well, it's the child. So, the child's not going to go with what I say, so the child's going to just talk about something completely different. And I've got to keep track of where we are in the conversation and what kind of is going on at once. So, there's this um, best known thing that's called Ravenclaw from CMU. It's kind of an old implementation, but the ideas are pretty basic, and you can implement them in Python. Um, so you have these dialogue agents, which are little pieces, little programs that correspond to pieces of dialogue. Um, so you have dialogue stack, which is all the, the agents, all the thing it wants to talk about. You know, I was talking about math, and I've been interrupted, and now I'm talking about toys, and the pieces of things on a stack. You also have an expectation agenda, so when someone says yes, well, you have to know that you just ask them a question, and that yes needs to be mapped to the thing you just asked them, not something from uh, 30 minutes ago, like in Rain Man. Um, and so you have two phases. You have an execution phase where you take the top dialogue manager off the stack, and then that dialogue manager does what it wants to do, which is uh, a dialogue agent off the stack. That dialogue agent does what it wants to do, like ask a question, and then you have this uh, listening phase where it takes the utterance from the from the user and matches it against all the things in the expectation agenda to figure out what question that person's answering or what new topic that person wants to discuss. And so you have something that looks like this. Um, you have the dialogue stack. You know, I, I just asked the the girl what's four point what's four plus five, and the child says, "Do you like Mr. Suffles?" There's a response. And testing for my daughter. This is exactly the kind of thing she does. And then, so what you have to do is go down the expectation agenda. And it says, arithmetic? No, this is not arithmetic. Plants? No. Stories? No. Okay, toys. Okay, this is about toys. So now you have to change that so that toys is up the top, and now we're talking about toys. And so you say, okay, very nice. Is he your favorite? And now you're talking about toys, and you're expecting like a yes or no answer. He's talking about toys as a pop now, and yes or no, kind of broadly. Can it be any kind of agreement? Um, and then she says, oh, of course. So then you update the database with a new favorite toy, and then you, you just keep going. You see, you need something that goes like this um, for a while. So there's this other thing that we won't talk about called state-based dialogue agents, which instead of using like this stack kind of architecture, uses a reinforcement learning architecture. You have states and actions and rewards, and you have uh, use reinforcement learning, which is how you, you train circus animals. And so reinforcement learning, you have a dude that walks around. Uh, when the person finds the pot of gold, then you remember the state space, and you say, okay, this is the way you got the pot of gold, and you do this a whole bunch of times. Eventually, you get some policy that says in any state, 
here's what I do. Of course, in a dialogue, the state is kind of weird. It's like, okay, if I just ask this question, and we were talking about this five minutes ago, then this is my state. And the person said this, okay, I take that into my state. And so you need a whole bunch of training data. In fact, it gets even crazier because you don't even know what state you're in because you have a text-to-speech and speech-to-text that are unreliable. So you have this thing called a partially observable uh, markup decision process, a POMDP. And then you have to come up with a policy in POMDP space, and we're, we're, we're making huge strides in sampling. And so, um, in fact, we may see some of that today. So this is starting to become more feasible. And uh, other plumbing, since I'm going to put the slides online, we don't have to go through this in too much detail. Uh, Spacey is a great way to work with text. You can do parsing. Uh, speech to text. Um, speech to text is a hard problem. Uh, there's a Python library for it. Um, and then it comes, it uses, uh, there's a nice blog post that it, it uses syncs. I, I found things didn't work very well. I used the uh, Google uh, version, and I'll show you how to do that there. And then um, you know, I use WaveNet, which is fancy uh, deep learning technology. Uh, there's also text to speech, which I do pretty stupidly in Python. I just call the operating system. Uh, I'm sure there are better ways to do that. Um, of course, WaveNet is one. And uh, different resources. Uh, it's really hard to find resources on TechBoss for some reason. They're all kind of just fluff articles. Uh, Jurassic is, is a great um, great resource. And uh, the conclusion. So the conclusion is we saw computers need to know about our conventions. We can code these into our grammars. So that works pretty well. Computers need to know not just our conventions, but these words need to tie into deeper semantic meaning. And this we can do... A little bit. Um, I, I wrote another blog post about a, a set of ideas about using physics simulations to try to have computers understand the world where we do. They should uh, simulate using physics. So it says, someone says beam. The computer has had experience with beams because it's physically simulated trying to carry them with fire and action without. Um, I, we don't have a good way yet of doing this um, negotiation of what words mean. I've seen a little work, but not a lot. And I have the same with um, same with talking about using the, the terms of uh, conversation, the rules of conversation. I've seen some work, not so much. Um, we're starting to move in that direction so that people can understand sarcasm and falsity and that kind of thing. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. I think we're out of time, but I will be around pretty much all day. So, yeah, thank you very much.